Hello and welcome to the Celtic Down Under podcast. I'm your host, Jared, and joining me tonight are John, Liam and Sean. How are you, John? I'm good. I'm very well. I'm getting my COVID, my first COVID jab this Friday, which is the most exciting thing I've happened to me since lockdown. So, yeah, exciting times, I guess, for me. But that's about how, it. Are you, how are you, Sean? Yeah, I feel like I've had some more exciting things happen recently than that. But, uh, <laughs> I guess if we're in lockdown in these states, you know, I, I guess the only shitty thing that's happened to me in the last week is Fremantle got spanked, uh, and that's <laughs> everything else has been good. And Liam, what's happening? Aye, all good here. The uh, the new Celtic tops arrived today, so that's uh, that's always a good thing. But uh, aye, on holiday for the next two weeks, and uh, got thoroughly pissed last night, so I'm a wee bit hungover today. Uh, good effort no, no issues here love it it's good fun uh. <laughs> and so um yeah it's been a interesting couple of days as a celtic fans this is going to be a good podcast we've got a bit to get through tonight so strap yourselves in and hope you enjoy the episode if you do please make sure you subscribe to the celtic down under podcast via your favorite podcast app if you're listening via apple Podcasts or spotify please leave us a review Preferably five stars, but if you think we're shit, you can do that too. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> if you think we're shit, still give us five stars. Help us out here. <laughs> exactly. Help, <laughs> help, help a brother out. That's what we like. <laughs> All right, so we've got a few Celtic games to discuss. So last week, Celtic 4, Jablonek 2 in the Europa League. We'll quickly go over that. I'll throw to you, Sean. Uh, yeah, this one was a bit of a ungodly hour for me so I wasn't uh, overly focused on it or taking notes um, some nice goals uh, could have actually had a few more um, and but you know the usual shaky defence story uh, particularly in regards to near Beaton and Joe Hart doing his best impression of Azealis Barkas uh, didn't even get his hands up for the goals I was like what is going on here man um, I mean I was like when I was going into it I was thinking Oh, surely we shouldn't be struggling against like so they were third place in the Czech League last year. So I was like, oh, Sparta Prague are pretty good. So, so that my first thought was Sparta Prague are really good. So these guys are going to be good. But then I was like, wait, that's like me saying Aberdeen or Hibs are really good because they're the third best team after us. And then I was thinking, should we be struggling against the third best team in the Czech Republic? And it occurred to me we would. Going into that game, or at least two weeks ago, we would have struggled over two legs against the, the third or fourth best team in Scotland, never mind the Czech Republic. So when I'm thinking, oh, we're playing the equivalent of Aberdeen and the Czech Republic, well, we'd struggle against the Aberdeen of Scotland, never mind the Aberdeen and Czech Republic. So uh, in that regard, we did better than I thought we would. And the defence is still shaky, but, you know, some good goals, could have had a few more, and, and we were the better team, to be honest. Um and we looked better than we did against Michelin, and it, it was a kind of, you know, based on what's happened since then, it seems to be a bit of a, a, a very much a stepping stone, hopefully, onto better things. Yeah, for me, I thought it was a bit of a launching pad game for us where we showed a bit of fight. Game could have got away from us. Like, if that was 12 months ago, that's the sort of game where, you know, once they get one goal, suddenly it's two and then all bets are off, basically. So it was good to see a bit of fight there from the boys. Um, then that was a good launching pad going into the weekend's game. But Liam, John, have you got anything you want to add about this game before we, we crack on into the weekend's game? Yeah. Um, I think there was a couple of things from that particular game you could have um, taken away at the time. I think Eddie getting dropped was a shock. I think that was... A, that was uh, obviously, it worked out really well, and we got to see we we uh, like the fans. We got to see um, Kyogo really what he what he was made of, and and the the start of um, ho- hopefully a successful career and stuff. Um, and the way that Kyogo and Abada were sort of um, linking up was really good to see, and we were seeing the beginnings of that. But yeah, I think we 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 saw a rusty heart. I think he stuck his hand up on um, Twitter or Instagram, whatever it was, and and just said, "Hey, look, I acknowledge that you know I can I can do better there, um, but and I will get better." So fingers crossed that that's that's the case. Um, but yes, uh, you know, 
the glaring issues that we all saw defensively, Star felt. Um, whether Bitton could have kept that goal out, I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I think the way that he was running at it and the way that the ball hit the post, I don't think there was much he could do. Um, but just, uh, but he, and, he, and he's, look, he is probably now a centre back for us, but he's not a, he's not a f- rounded centre back. So he's just plugging a hole. Um, but yeah, going forward, we looked we looked great. And actually, if anything, that, that game was from what you um what you've been saying Jared and stuff about um about Ange and how he likes to play football that was kind of the result i think i was expecting for this entire season you know score four um ship two um but yeah so it was good to see good to see celtic back into the flow that we expect um and overall pleased but yeah defensively not surprised but we obviously need to strengthen there yeah, I wasn't expecting it to be a 2 0 result or a 1 0 or whatever, but I'll throw to you, Liam, for your thoughts on the game. Uh, yeah, I would just add that um, the, the really good thing about Celtic right now is like game by game, you can see things coming together. You know, the, the, the first Jablonich game was a big step up, I think, from the way we played in the Hearts game. And then the league game, which we're going to get onto in a minute, was another step up from the Jablonich game. I think it's all just, you can see every, every game as the new players get to know each other, as the players that were already there come to understand their new roles within this team. We're just getting better and better every every game that comes. And we've still got more to come in, which is even more exciting. So I've, I've got my... Sorry. Sorry, Jared. Now it's just scary how quick the improvement is, but at the same time, I've seen it happen before, so I mm. think it's, it's great to see. And long may it continue to keep improvement in, in incremental bits, game by game, week by week, over the course of the season. We'll be up and about and flying. So what were you going to say, Sean? Yeah, I was going to say, I've got my, my dinner plate and cutlery ready uh, for when we talk about the Dundee game so that I can eat my words. Um, <laughs> but just before we move on to that, I've got um, I've got some starters that I'm going to drag Jared and Liam into on the uh, in regards to how you actually good the players looked wearing the third kit against Jablonek. <laughs> okay, I'll put my hand up. It's the first of my two confessions tonight, everyone. So forgive me, Father, I have sinned. <laughs> I have that that third kit. I said it looked terrible. Now seeing it on the players on the pitch, okay, looks good. I retract my previous statement. Probably wouldn't look good on a big bloke like me at the pub, <laughs> but on the players. On the pitch? Okay, cool. It gets a thumbs up from me now. <laughs> I've got this theory that whenever a strip is all three three parts the same colour, that it looks shit hot no matter what the colour is. Like yeah. if you think of like Real Madrid all white. And every now and again, Scotland, we're all navy, like navy, navy, navy. And it looks so much better. And that, I get it. that's my theory. Whenever the, one, can... the one problem with that theory, Sean, is when the Socceroos went from their traditional green shorts with yellow socks and yellow shirts to all yellow. Looked terrible. <laughs> I, I don't agree. I, I thought it looked good. <laughs> nah. That's just me. Okay. I don't know. It's just, we'll just we'll agree opinion. to disagree on that one. Yeah. But, but you know, that, most I, importantly, I, you guys are slowly coming over to my dark side. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, if you look well, at the wall I, behind I've Liam. Got the, yes, I have the shot on yeah. the wall. So, yep, <laughs> I, am a, I am a hypocrite. I'm a complete and utter hypocrite, and I acknowledge it, but it looks glorious in person. It is a really nice looking top, and I'm quite hey, glad I, paid, I bought it. Hey, Liam, I yep. think you and me will just enjoy that humble pie. Let's just cop mm. that. And then we'll give Sean his dish, his big serve on yes. that plate we were talking about. Talking about Celtic 6, Dundee 0 in the SPFL. Mm. Uh, team performance in general, unbelievable. Haven't seen anything like that. Oh, uh, going back years, going back like that was just a flawless performance. Yes, there was a couple of misplaced passes here and there, but overall, in general, I can't really pick too many faults out of that game, other than we could have won. This is going to sound harsh, but we could have scored ten easy. Oh, yeah. easy, yeah, hundred percent, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Kyogo alone could have had six. Yeah, exactly. Should have, should have. <laughs> he he scored. <laughs> he scored harder goals. <laughs> he scored harder goals than the and then the ones he missed. I think like that. 
That first pass for the first miss a couple of minutes in from Rogic, that give and go, that was amazing. It looked like it was straight off a touch football field. Yeah. I know we're talking preseason, like Ange, he likes one on two touch football. So that doesn't surprise me. But like when Rogers come in, the talk was possession and it looked like the ball was moving fast, but we'd hold on to the ball where with Ange, it's get it, one touch, two passes max, move it, get it forward, and push on. And, oh, it's it's amazing to see. It's 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 what really good teams do often is is sort of, um, is pass, this one, two touch passing. And even, and, and at the moment, I, I mean, Celtic are obviously not perfect at it, um, and it's, it's a fairly new system, I, I, I imagine. Um, but even when there's maybe not options in front of, defenders and stuff you're still doing you're still seeing that fast paced um quick passing because they're just doing it across the back line so they're shipping it from the left to the right really quickly which opens up different opportunities and that's where we're getting a lot of joy from is is actually is moving it across the back line fast instead of holding on to it and you know and and actually playing that possession football and that's well, just it's good to see the funny thing there though, john is you're saying moving it across that back line fast and I'm just going to quickly jump in with this stat that I've heard because looking on like Instat and everything like that, the two highest ever amounts of passes in a game that Joe Hart has made in his career have been the Jablon Etch game and then the Dundee game. Hmm. They've been his two highest ever. So if he's willing to improve and play that role for us, great. I'm happy to see it. But what was your take on the game, Sean? Yeah, actually... Got a bit of fear at the start. Uh, looking back at my messages with my old man, and like the first twelve minutes were all just what these pa- this passing shit. We don't look at the races. What's going on here, kind of thing. And um, when about twelve minutes into the game, uh, we create our first chance. Uh, Kyogo misses his first sitter, and after that, the floodgates just kind of opened up, and we just clicked and got into gear. Uh, I, I messaged you guys during the day about, I mean, it was a nice nice time for the game, you know, 10 p.m., my time. Uh, so it was the first kind of competitive game. But it's been at that time. So I was looking at the bets around about midday. Um, and I was like, oh, Dundee are shit. The manager's linked with a, a, a move away. They're not going to be playing well tonight. So I'll, I'll see if I can stick on some bets here. So I was stuck on $15 on uh, Celtic Handicap. So I got that. And then I was looking at, right, who's going to score goals? Oh, Kyogo's up front. So I'll say, Kyogo to score two or more goals. Okay, that's $6. How much is it for a hat trick? Okay, click on hat trick, $27. Oh, that's better. I'll go and remove the two goals from my betting slip and just put on the hat trick. And then I look at it and my betting slip had some sort of coding error and it's doubled up the two of them so that I can bet on the two goals and three goals like two or oh, more goals and three goals together. So it's doubled it up and I won four, I put 10 bucks on it and won 470. So I'm using <laughs> that those winnings to buy some salt and sauce to sprinkle <laughs> on my words that I'm enjoying is my main course for having bagged him out last week for his shit performance <laughs> against Hearts. My one worry though is uh, that he's he might uh, end up getting shifted out wide left if we end up signing some striker or something then after what I've seen from him, he's not a winger. He's a striker. Uh, like, in, it's certainly in terms of Scottish football anyway. Um, and again, one swallow does not make a summer, but he's definitely not a bad player. He may, he may all these comparisons to Larson are pure nonsense, obviously. Uh, yeah, but, um, they are nonsense. Like, from what I've seen in that one game, the one player he reminds me of, particularly how the player started at this time in Celtic, was Magic Zerafsky. Now, I don't I don't know if it's obvious from watching on TV, but I was going to the games at the time when Zaravsky signed and he was doing the same things that Kyogo was doing in terms of movement, making all these runs. And, and it kind of Zaravsky kind of got out of it. And the reason for that was he wasn't getting supply. So he just kind of got fatigued with it and stopped making these runs and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he adapted his game to the team. Kyogo is currently doing the same things that Zaravsky did when he first signed. And that is, to me, that is the best comparison is early Zaravsky. Uh, and I, I, again, I'm not anyone is comparing to Larson, pure nonsense. Players like Mohamed El Yunusi score hat tricks against these teams, uh, but he is definitely 
a better than average player and the acid test of Ibrox will be very revealing to how he really is. The funny thing is he makes those runs and he's getting the ball now, but I'm just waiting for at the start, the, the next phase of the whole Andrew ball. When the striker makes that run and the ball doesn't go to him because the defenders, the defenders step up, so he's off, they play him offside, then the ball goes wide and then the wing is playing because now he's back onside. That's when it's going to get even more dangerous for these defences because if they want to play a high line, then you've got guys with speed out wide in Christie and Abada who can get that ball, beat a man, get past it, and now the centre-backs are nowhere near Kyogo in the middle of the pitch if the ball comes into him. So it's going to get it's basically pick your poison. Yeah. I do, I, yeah. I do wonder how sustainable the, the high-pressure thing is. Like I've, It's been a while since I've seen a striker put that kind of pressure on a defence. I think maybe you had the kind of likes of Stuart Armstrong doing it under Dyla, but he was as the winger, you know. But Furuhashi, like putting in those slide tackles up front, was, like it gets your it blows, it gets your blood going, you know what I mean? Like it gets your heart rate going for the you know, like, come on, yes. And it really does take the pressure off the defense, which uh, Ange mentioned after the game. Like, can you imagine Edward it, doing that? You know? Yeah, no, it, it, he's not that type of player. But and it's but it's infectious as well, isn't yeah. it? When you see when you see your forward man who's sliding in to stop the ball from the opposition's corner flag. Every, yeah. Everybody else goes, oh, well, if he's doing it, Christ, I better, you know, be doing, if, if not more. And that's what that's what, we, that's what we needed. That's the game that Ange wants to play. That's what we haven't been doing for well, at least 18 months. So, yeah, it was fucking brilliant to see. It's good to see that. But then also when you compare that to what Eddie's been doing, it, may, it stands out at like dog's balls. I'll be honest yeah. here. It's like... All effort, all action, and then languid Eddie. It's it's exciting. He plays a different game. Edward's game is completely different, I think, though. I mean, I, I have noticed, I have noticed, and I wonder if everybody else sees the same, but since Kyogo's started in front of him and obviously doing these sliding tackles and um, all of that, Ed, Edward's running a lot more when he's not on the ball, so <laughs> so maybe it isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, maybe it's a bit of a maybe he's you know, he, and and so he should be gutted that he's lost his spot. But um, yeah, uh, t- who knows? Maybe we'll see a different Edward. Well, I doubt well, it. What we, should, what we should do now is throw to our resident Japanese football expert Liam because we've been talking pish for a couple of minutes here and. <laughs> We're going to get him involved in the convo. So, what's your take, Liam? All hail Emperor Kyogo. That's my. <laughs> <laughs> that's my. Uh, nice. That's my. Uh, my thoughts. Um, no, the the thing is, it's been great. Um, obviously, you know, we can joke about what, what Sean said last week after the Hearts game, but there's been a lot of people and a lot of Celtic fans running down Japanese football running down Kyogo as a player, questioning his ability, questioning his physicality, and questioning whether or not he would cut it. And to see him go out and do that against possibly the biggest hammer throwers in the league in Dundee, a team that should have had two red cards in the course of that game at least. Yep. Um, In addition addition to the one that they got. um, Yeah, Kyogo really is the real deal. And it's great to see it's really it was really refreshing on monday morning to actually pick up a paper here and see celtic mentioned for the first time since nakamura left it's really really nice to see i get that mate because it's the same over here we can look at the paper and it's like oh what's celtic done there's a little little column here or you got optus mm-hmm. sports every monday they have their weekend wrap that they go through the premier league and the last two of them have started with celtic even on the day Messi's leaving Barcelona. The first story that was there was Ange Postacoglu's Celtic have a 6 0 win over Dundee. In further <laughs> news, Lionel Messi is leaving Barcelona. <laughs> that's, how it, that's how it should be. Talking about that, did you see the um did you see the nonsense that was uh in, in the papers the other day? It was like they ran two headlines together from the same thing. I think it was the Daily Record and it said uh <laughs> Messi announces leaving Barcelona as Rangers step up search for Morelos replacement. <laughs> <laughs> as in they literally conflated. And they literally put the two things together. <laughs> no shame. No shame. <laughs> Scotland shame. 
Oh, yeah. gosh. <laughs> Honestly, was it what's the saying? Uh, couldn't give them a redneck with a blowtorch. No, no. <laughs> yeah, but before we move on, I wanted to talk about a few of the other performances. Like the midfield three, I thought were unbelievable. I don't know if you yeah. guys agree, but it looked like to me that what's happened is so when you see the lineup come out, you're like, oh, so we're going with the thing that Lennon did where we're playing two number tens. Uh, so that's what I thought. I was like, okay, Turnbull and yep. Rogic were playing two number 10s. But then the way it shook out was not that. What actually happened was McGregor was playing the Scott Brown role and Turnbull had dropped into the Callum McGregor role from the last two years. And Rogic was the number 10 playing the role that Turnbull has not been successfully doing so far this season, but has done in the previous years. And I thought all three, after about 10, 15 minutes of settling into it, I mean, Callum McGregor was just, awesome throughout like in a game like if Kyogo gets subbed before that third goal McGregor's your man in the match do you know what I mean he was he was unreal he was everywhere he did everything he was tackling passing like it, it's just unbelievable how good he is uh this season so far and Turnbull again took a bit of time getting used to his new role but looked great Rogic looked great great goal I thought that midfield three I think that might be it for if they're all fit and firing, I think that's it. I mean, Sorrow will probably be rightfully shitty about being dropped, but come on. We used to joke back on the old Oz Celts podcast about the holy trinity of the Celtic midfield. When Bruni was out, you had McGregor as a deep wire, and you had mm. Christie and Rogic. So it's a similar sort of dynamic there. Instead of Christie being in that eight, you've got Turnbull there, and... If Turnbull pushes forward, Rogic can jump in and fill that hole occasionally. But yeah, it works really well. Yeah, it's a six, yeah. eight, ten. You know, where where Turnbull's the eight. I thought. I, I thought. Um, I think in recent games, Turnbull's been a bit hot and cold. But uh, in that game, he was just all cylinders firing, and it was yeah, you know, the three of them. You're absolutely right. They were. I mean, look. I, I take your point with McGregor. I mean, he does a lot of the stuff that is thankless and kind of gets lost in games, but he's the engine, right? That's He's absolutely fantastic. Um, and I, well, I guess we we'll, might as well talk about it, but see McGregor's um, post-match huddle. Oh, yeah. fucking hell. That is what we have been needing for so long. And, and, and I said it. I said McGregor's going to grow into the role as a captain. And, you know, a lot of people fucking saying it on forums, saying, you know, nah, he's he's never a captain. That's a, that's a captain if, you know, he ever saw one. So I was, I was iffy about it, John, but only on, on the reason that... I never meant you, but there you go. No, you, no, no, no. <laughs> take it. No, take I'm, it. Saying I was, I'm not saying that I wasn't I was against it. I was a bit iffy because the fact was last year when he was a captain, he'd come out and make the comments like, we didn't know what, what we were doing, we didn't know this. So... I couldn't judge him on that. So it was one of the ones where I wasn't sure how to go, but you take Bruni out of the situation, you give him a manager who gives him clear instructions, and, yeah, happy with that. It's great to see. He's mm. growing and he's stepping up, and it's his team. And you can only imagine what he was saying in there. This is the standard. We don't drop below this effing standard going forward. That's the sort of thing you would have said. Yeah. Starfelt needs to learn to bend his back a little more to get into the huddle properly, but other than that, he's all good. <laughs> He'll get there. He'll definitely get there. Yeah. St- Stephen hey. Welsh looked like he should be our first choice centre back as well over that game as well. I'm glad that Beton was dropped. Welsh was much better. Oh, dude, night and day. Absolute night and day. I mean, the, the, the only thing um, that worries me, I guess, well, I don't worry. Roger just needs to stay, stay fit. That's all. I mean, well, it's and, and like the shape. Uh, it doesn't the shape I've seen him in. Absolutely, a hundred percent. I mean, but then we, how, how does McCarthy fit into this now? Oh, Is shit, it? I don't even think of that. Ah, right. Yeah. Well, but, but, but do we have? Do we actually? Do we actually have depth now? Yes, I, I, yes, I, we do. Holy Christ! Are we actually starting to see squad depth? So can we play McCarthy for games? What maybe our backs might be against the wall a little bit more than playing teams like Dundee? Maybe. It's a really when we had when we had Stuart Armstrong coming off the bench, and then or you could start him, and you could bring Cal Mack could have a game off, or Bruni could have a game off, or Christie could jump in and help out wherever. You had options in the middle of the park. Now suddenly we have that. Yep. So 
with the intensity we're going to be playing at, you, you know guys aren't going to be able to play every game 90 minutes like that. So we can actually give McGregor a breather if we need to. If Rogic looks like, oh, yeah, he's, he's played his 60, 70 minutes, three straight games. If he needs a breather, great. Perfect thing is McCarthy can play anywhere from 6, 8, or 10. So mm. gives us that depth. It's amazing. Two, uh, two, two holes. Sorry, Liam. There you go. Uh, I was just going to add that, um, you know, don't want to talk too much about them across the city, but uh, the fact that we won and Rangers lost in the same weekend, that was a really, it was an important thing because, okay, still 30 odd games to go in the season, whatever, right? But the fact that they are now as good as they're going to get, especially now they've been pumped out of the Champions League, right? They are not bringing in any big names, right? Mm. They're not bringing, they might even have to sell a couple of their existing players to balance the books. That's as good as they're going to get. We are still probably only halfway through our transitional phase into what Ange's new team is going to look like. We are only we are only going to get better, and they're only going to get worse, and they're going to face harder games than Dundee United as, as the season goes on. You know, well, Liam, it's also been a year and a half since that last happened. Yes, yep, that's also so, a very valid point. It's it's not just like you know it is great always, but also it's been so long since it's happened. Aye. And the thing is, historically, how often has it happened that they've lost and we've gone out and got a draw or we've struggled in the in the, the game that the on the Sunday after they've lost on the Saturday? You know, that's that is something that, you know, going back five, ten years, that is something that has bothered Celtic. But for us to come out and win and win in such style after they've slipped up, it really, really sends out the right message for the rest of the season. Agree with well, you, and that's why that topic is on the run sheet for later on, so we can have a bit of a <laughs> at their situation. But tying that back in to what you were going to say, something there, John? Oh, no, I was just going to say it. it, it, um, it I, I get Liam's point and everything, but um, it just gives us it lets us off a little bit because obviously we got we got beat by hearts, and now do you know what I mean? So we're kind of on even grounds now. And and now we we've got to keep going. We've got to keep up the momentum. Like yes, okay, they got beat by um, a weak opposition, and we beat weak opposition. So um, you know, we'll just we'll take it as it is, and we'll go. Thanks for the favor, almost or not favor, but whatever. Um, but I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, guys. But I don't think they've spent any money yet. Is it not all frees that they've had in their transfer? Like they no, they've cool. they signed a few uh, that were done before the window opened. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cross border like, ones, that's so only three hundred grand here, four hundred grand there, sort of thing. Okay. No, I think they paid what? money for Sakala. Did they not? Oh yeah, but that'd be oh, staggered. Well, over the, that'd be staggered over the four years though. Yeah, that was one that was done in like April as well. Right. Um, okay. Well, they've not spent much then, have they? They've not. They've not. No. Like, yeah. No. I did the maths on us today, and we've if we sign this bloke, we're going to talk about they are they're the striker Henry from. From over in Belgium, that's going to put us up at 19 million pounds spent so far. Mm. Too right. But the thing is, with what we brought in for IR and what we brought in for Frimpong, we're still at a, at a negative net. So we've still got yeah, we're money. Still on, yeah. Still on the black. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two kind of holes that stood out for me in terms of the squad uh, from the weekend was, uh, again, the same thing I said last time Starfelt on the left centre back who cannot use his left foot. Uh, there was another back pass incident that almost led to a fuck up. And he does not look like he's comfortable at left centre back. Um, I get that he's the senior player, but I would honestly be putting Welsh out there rather than Starfelt. And I'd be maybe looking at saying a left centre back like Scales or Davies. I think that's something that we need um, to shunt Starfield back to the right. Jared? I was going to say Itakura, anyone? Oh, is he left? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a left footer. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Then, but and the, the other hole that stood out for me was there were two points in the game. One apart from when Ralston nearly got his leg broken and the the Hun referee let it go. There was another point where he kind of uh, did a slide tackle and kind of felt his groin when he was getting up. And in both occasions, I'm thinking to myself, uh, "What happens if he gets injured? Who the fuck goes right back?" <laughs> and um, 
Do you know what I mean like I mean it's a fact that we have the top scoring right back in Scotland, uh, the best right back in Scotland, therefore. Um, so the if he Scottish gets injured, tattoo. yeah, or you know even the the Scottish Tavernier. If we put him on penalties, he'll <laughs> probably finish the year's top scorer. Um, I mean he's back two goals with his left foot so far. Uh, yeah, maybe he's better. I, I, would you rather have Tavernier? I'd rather have Ralston. Not gonna lie, <laughs> I'd rather have Ralston. Yeah, Ralstoninho. <laughs> <laughs> to quote Louis from the cynic, keep Rail Chops in the team. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I honestly, I was, <laughs> I don't know, I, I can't believe I'm saying it, but he's he's definitely um, he's winning me over Ralston. He's definitely. Um, he, I, I agree with a lot of other, um, you know, podcasters, Celtic podcasts and stuff when they're saying like it's Ralston's um, jersey to lose at this point. It, 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 even if we were to buy out right back, Ralston's putting a you know um, a marker down on the ground saying, "Well, you, oh, okay, you've come in, but you've got to take the position off me first. I, I'm I'm glad He's, if he keeps this up, and he, I think he could play twenty games, twenty five games this year, this season. Yeah, I would add that I think before the season started, I thought Ralston was surplus to requirements. I thought get rid of him, right? I'll be honest and say that's what that was my thought. That was the thought of a lot of Celtic fans. But now it's like, yeah, it's questionable whether he's good enough to be our first choice right back, but he is definitely good enough to be part of Celtic's squad. No question. Yeah, I think he's long term, he'll be a good number two to have there. But at the moment, it's his jersey and the guy we're linked with, Buta, apparently looks like he's on his way to Everton. So. Back to square one again. Oh, well, that's why that got dragged out. He was waiting for that Premier League team. Yeah. So, so when you have like a, a top class squad like Celtic or whatever Premier League team, you tend to have two left backs, two right backs, and then a, a fifth full back who can play either side. And coming into the season, I was like happy, happy to be signed Ralston on the contracts so that he can be that number five uh, full back. But now I'm happy with him as a one or two, depending on who else we sign. And now I'm not going to pretend that. Like I said, that was my position this year. Uh, but if I want, if I go back five years, okay, even further, uh, back when he was at Queen's Park on loan as a 16-year-old, uh, it's not often I really give youth players a kind of, yeah, he's going to make it kind of tick. But he was one that I was really impressed with as a 16-year-old, and I thought he was going to make it. And then when he got rinsed by Neymar and had a couple of poor games uh, against some Scottish teams, uh, you know, my estimation of him dropped and, and I was like, yeah, it turns out I was wrong. Well, it might be he's now getting his renaissance. It might, those two goals he's had in the last two weeks, that's his Christie moment. Well, Christie was absolutely... Christie was another one, right, where I was seeing flashes of uh, when he was coming on as a sub. I'm like, oh, that's a really great pass. That's a really great touch. Why is he not getting a game here? But, you know, and he keeps getting, you know, 12, 15 minutes under Rodgers or whatever every second week. Goes to Aberdeen and Lowen, comes back and then bang, he comes on against Hearts at half time and then follows up with a great performance again in the next game and that's it, two games Christie's a first team player all of a sudden and that, you could I could easily see that these last two league games, that's uh, Ralston now established as a first team squad player and he could be one for a, 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 a proper contract extension in the near future um, yeah, that's the way I see it Absolutely, and I'm going to use that mention of Christy there as a perfect little segue for us because, yeah, more humble pie for me. I said if Christy <laughs> doesn't Christy doesn't sign a new contract and wants to leave, make him play with the Colts. Well, does he deserve a new contract, guys? I want to know that. Yes. And, if you, and if you were, would you? What would you offer to him? Would you have a release clause in there? Would you? How would you tackle it? So I'll throw to you first, John. Um. Wh- I think release clauses only really benefit um, clubs if they if they acknowledge that the player's sort of half in, half out. So if the player wants um, the ability to move on at their own discretion, then that, I think that would I think that works. Maybe that would work in this particular situation for Christie. Um, if if Celtic were to put in a release clause that only top five leagues in the world could really realistically pay. Um, then that and that's what he wants to move on to. Then yeah, that kind of benefits everyone. But it, obviously, that answers whether we I would 
give him a contract or not. Hell yeah. Give him three, four years, whatever he's comfortable taking. The longer we can have Christian, if he continues playing the way that he is, which is no reason why he shouldn't, because we just he's just gone back to his old fantastic self. Um, that's a fantastic asset to have in this squad. Because Adam, when did when did we get Christie the left winger? Jesus Christ, when did that happen? I mean, we all thought he was great as a an attacking midfielder. Apparently, he's even fucking better as, a, as left wing. So, yeah, keep him for as long as we can possibly keep him for. Lenny Ball played him out of position on the right. Well, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, that is a serious point, though. See, when you, you look at guys like Christie, Ralston, Rogic, even, I think, Callum McGregor, how much of last season was down to players underperforming? How much of it was down to poor management? Because under a coach who knows what he's doing, a coach who has got them motivated, a coach who is playing them, he's identified the best way to play these guys and is now playing them in those positions. These are like new signings. They're like completely different players to what they were last last season. You know? Maybe that's part of it, Liam. Like, that's what I'm thinking. Christy needs a new contract, yes, but maybe he's looking around. This is where, if we were to give him a new contract, and that's why I brought up about the release clause, maybe mm-hmm. he's like, okay, there's no moves that are interesting me at the moment. I don't want to go to Burnley. I don't want to no. go to those sort of teams down the bottom end of the Premier League. I want to go to an Everton or I want to go to a Leicester or I want to go to a top six sort of team. So maybe he's thinking... Well, what's the worst that can happen? I can sign a new deal for 18 months, two two years, whatever it is, but have a release clause so at the end of the season I can play in myself into that move, Celtic make some money, and I still get a pay bump in the moment because apparently he's one of the, one of the lowest earners in their first team squad. Aye, well, yeah, that's got to change. Aye. And it also protects him against that ACL tear or whatever, if he's exactly. got... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's, it's an objective fact that he could have in the last six weeks signed a contract with someone else he's had six weeks in which he could sign for another team and he's not done it Uh, but uh, so just to talk about the value of him if you look at that third Kyogo goal at the weekend that through ball from Christie I if somebody can find me a YouTube highlight of a better through ball than that uh, other than Xavi or Iniesta I would love to see it because that is one of the best through balls I have ever seen. And I mean anywhere, ever. Like, when he plays that pass, I'm like, that's, I'm like okay, the defender's cutting that out or it's going to the keeper. Like, 99, 999 times out of 1,000, any player that tries to pay, play a pass at like that, it's either going too long or it's going too short. And that was, I've never seen a through ball through the middle between the two centre-backs as precise as that. Uh, it was on... You know what it, you know what that one reminded me of, Sean? There was a couple of um goals scored by Dembele in Rogers' first season in the Invincible mm-hmm. one, where Tam was looking to the left and putting that ball through. That's mm-hmm. very similar to that, except the pass was probably three times as long. Yeah. So unbelievable piece of skill there. What I said, it was just so far out. And I honestly like because Kyogre's not even in the camera shot, you're like do you know I mean you don't you don't know where it's going, and it just oh, it was it was just absolute glorious. That that was again talking about man in the match. Obviously, Kyogo got a hat trick, but McGregor yeah. and Christie, like yeah. apart from the three goals, those two, I could make, you could easily make a case for McGregor or Christie getting man in the match for their performances as well. And in terms of how much money uh, Christie wants, well, what's what's McGregor on twenty five thousand? He's the highest earner. Give Christie give Christie that if, oh, if he dropped you- if. If he's reluctant to sign it for twenty five, just say okay, we'll put a fifteen million release clause in if you sign it as well. Yeah, and you can go whenever you want. And and if uh, if you want a six million release clause, fine, we'll only pay you fifteen thousand. Do you know what I mean? We just match up the the salary to whatever release clause he wants. But I'd rather just give him top, literally make him on a par with the top earner with no release clause. That's what I want. And if he insists on a release clause, sliding scale, whatever you think you're worth you know, versus the release clause. That's perfect. Totally sense. agree. All right. So let's kick on to a couple of other things here. The B team, the Colts, they had a 2-0 home win against Ber- Berwick or Berwick Rangers. Uh, Brooks and Barter scored, and then they had a 2-0 away win 
have a bonus United. But Sosa and Davison with the with the goals there. We'll also click talk about the women's team quickly. They had a three nil forfeit win after winning three one on the night versus Patrick Thistle in the cup. Two goals to Charlie Wellings. Was it Kathleen McGovern, Sean? Yep, the third goal, yep. 19-year-old. Yep. Also some women's news. The SWPL Player of the Year, Lisa Robinson, moves on loan to Birmingham. And then I'll let you run with this one, Sean, where the, about the Women's Champions League. So Yeah, you. so the women have flown out to Trondheim to play in a mini group. So... The way the women's Champions League's been split up is a kind of round one, round two, group then group stage thing, where round two is the knockout. And round one is a very peculiar um, four-team mini tournament, round robin. So Celtic are playing Levante. Uh, and again, it's in Norway. Uh, that's right, isn't it? Sorry. Rosenberg, Norway. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I was just second-guessing myself there. So yeah, they're playing Levante in Norway. And then whoever wins that game will play the winner of Rosenberg and Minsk to get into the the, the final knockout round before the groups. I don't muck around yeah. there. That's a quick little system, that. It's a bit weird, but anyway. Yeah. Good luck, girls, and go get the wins. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So on Thursday, Scotland time, Friday our time, we play the reverse game at Celtic Park against Jablonek. 60,000 people in Celtic Park. Thank God. Cannot wait to see that. What an experience it'll be for all the new boys. Get out there under the disco lights, full house, to see what it's all about. Oh, I can't wait. What are you guys expecting to see in that game? What sort of score predictions? What, a repeat at Dundee, maybe? I don't know. Who knows? I, I, I mean... I, I the manager of um, Yablonek came out and said that he's he's expecting his players just to fucking shit it basically against <laughs> sixty thousand fans who haven't been in the haven't had a full stadium in in the past eighteen months. So he's fully expecting his team just to bottle it basically. Uh, that, which I mean, at least he's honest, eh? Because that's probably what is going to happen. I, I I honestly, if we play the same way we played against Dundee, I mean, the only difference here might be that Yab- Yablonek might know they're in for a tough evening and might just park the bus and sit back the entire game. So we might not see a big free flowing game. So, um, it, I mean, it could be something around like the three nil, um, scoreline, maybe four nil. Uh, but yeah, I, I think we're going to have 75% possession, something like that and just dominate the game, to be honest. Sean. Yeah, I think same, same as John. We'll go three nil up within an hour. Chuck on the kids. Uh, and just ride the game out without injuries. Aye, four now. I think um, just we will just see it out comfortably, and they will go on essentially a damage limitation exercise. And as Sean said, once we're a few goals up, I expect a wholesale changes at half time, or whenever that is, an hour into the game maybe, and just ride it out because we've got quite a tricky cup tie at the weekend that we want to be keeping an eye on as well, you know? Well, last week I said it would be like 7-0 against um, Dundee. is a bit of a joke, just taking the piss. So I'll do another take the piss one here because you guys have covered what I actually <laughs> want to say. We're going to win 18-0 <laughs> and Kyogo is going to score nine. <laughs> so, so it's going to be 17. It's gonna, yeah, it's going to be 17 nil. yeah. <laughs> As, um, as, even, as, yeah, as, I think you were dead, Jared. But we were me- we were messaging during the game, like mm. like and that that one where Edward headed that across the line in the last minute, and I was like, he's going to get seven. And, and uh, <laughs> the two Celtic players tackled each other. I was like, oh, Jared is so close. Um, for for yeah, anybody who re- who remembers the uh, the UK game show Family Fortunes, I'll quote. Les Dennis and say if it comes in I'll give you the money myself <laughs> <laughs> fair enough all good and then we've got Hearts in the League Cup so what are you guys expecting to see in that mm. yeah well I mean I mean Hearts are going to come out I think I think I mean hopefully we, I mean we have been but hopefully we continue this improvement um, and look hand on heart I expect a win 
but I don't think it's going to be. I don't think it's going to be easy sailings. Um, Hearts had surprised me a, a lot. I guess um, how quickly they've bounced back. Um, they look a good side, so it could be three two three one for me. I still think we're going to win, um, but yeah, we, we have to learn our lessons there. We always have to go out and prove a point about how much of a blip that game was. So I, yeah, I really want to see Celtic playing the best <laughs> of their abilities again. I, I think uh, well, Hearts are now thirteen games in a row undefeated. Mm. Um, so I, I, but I think it goes the way that the Titan Castle game should have went, where you know we should have went two one up if the linesman knew how to do his job. Hart should have had a man sent off, and I think in front of the home crowd, those two things will eventuate, and we will go through two one. I fingers crossed. I two one would be my prediction as well. I think just a straight reverse of the of the opening day of the season. Yeah, I'm saying three one. Yeah, it's going to be one of those games. I think it's going to be. I mean, you could even it could even I could see it ending three one, but I could see it being one each until seventy minutes. One That's of those. What I'm thinking. I think it's yeah. going to be two one or something like that from early on, and then they'll be like pushing for an equaliser, and then we just get one on the other at the yeah. other end later on. So that's what get one maybe eighty third, eighty fourth minute, something like that. Because I think a t- I, I think a, a team like Hearts will know our weaknesses well, and and you know, the way that the Celtic's weaknesses are what has always been, which is you just need to split the two defenders in the middle, and you you know any midfielder is going to get joy out of that. So I mean, so you could easily see it being you know one of those games where. It's a draw for for a while until we get them on the break or something. But hey, let's fingers crossed that we actually play to our abilities. What one thing that I'm going to be particularly looking out for is, apart from uh, that, this lad Benangimi, he was pretty good in the first game. But I'm going to be keeping a close eye on Suter because in that last game he looked better than any defender we've had in the last uh, two three years, and we're spending we're chucking like three four million at players at Starfield. Suter looked better than Starfelt. Is he going to cost us more than three four million? I wouldn't have thought so. He's not even uh, the best suitor in his family. Get his brother. Well, that's the yeah. Stockers. Get Harry in. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, oh, maybe, maybe that's a shout as well. Get them both in. Uh, but um, I, I think I know he's had his injury. He's played like eleven games in three years, something like that, because of he's ruptured his Achilles on each foot. Like so, he's ruptured one of them twice, another one once, or something like that. So if he's over that. To me, he is a target. Well, it doesn't sound like he's got any Achilles left. That's why maybe he is over it. <laughs> yeah. But I think I'm, I'm going to be watching him closely. I think that's someone we should be looking at. Yeah. All right. Just cracking on to a couple transfer rumours that we touched on a bit earlier, but apparently two clubs are currently interested in Barkas. Do we say good riddance, guys? What do you reckon? Yep. I think so. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just not worked out for him. Um, I, I defended him a lot last season, but the frustrating thing is he'll go somewhere else and probably be a great goalkeeper once he gets his confidence back. But Fine. it's not, it's not yeah. going to be at Celtic. So, let him, aye, cheerio. Let him Give go him put a, a future fee on there. Chuck on a percentage in. Happy days. See you later, Cabbage Ends. Exactly what I was going to say. Give him a Hendry bio deal. Uh, you know, go and be competent here. This is the fee. Cheerio. Yep. And then you've got the rumours of Edward. So there's been a few little twists in the last 24 hours or so, but Edward had been linked with Brighton still, while Southampton were interested. However, they've since put a bid in for Adam Armstrong from Blackburn. Crystal Palace is interested, and Roma were apparently interested. However, Tammy Abraham's on his way there from Chelsea. So today's story is that Edward is contemplating playing his deal out and leaving on a free. If that happens, if he stays at the club, then you think that would affect the rumour of Celtic signing, signing Thomas Henry from OH Louvren for $7 million, which was going to be his replacement. Thoughts on that, John? Well, I still think we um, should be going in for Henry regardless of what Edward decides. Um, I don't think Ayeti is close to the standard of what we need. 
Uh, I don't think any so. Well, I think I, I think this fans is um, split with Griff. I don't want him anywhere near Celtic. So that really leaves uh, Furuhashi and um, as our only viable striker at the moment. So I still would like another one in. Um, and I think Henri, by the sounds of it, by a lot of the reports, um, is a completely different forward than we have. Um, very much more of a poacher. He's a huge lad as well. He's like six four, six five, and that's where he gets most of his joy is scoring headers and stuff. Um, and that just changes um, the dynamic um, of any type of um, Celtic formation, especially when we're playing teams that park the bus and we're having to cross the ball in a lot. If having somebody who can um, head uh, score goals from headers would be a fantastic asset. So, I mean, look, Edward sticking around, good. I mean, I'm happy. Um, if he wants to stick around, but I still think we need another striker. I also, I also think we need some sort of money from him. But hey, can, can I just stop the bus and pause for a second here? What you've just said there, it, well, true, and and I agree, is fucking madness that you're talking about <laughs> Furuhashi as our only viable striker when we've got a nine million pound Edward and a five million pound Ayeti sitting on the bench, and Griffiths, who's scored like over a hundred goals for Celtic, sitting in the stands. And you're talking about Furuhashi as our only viable striker, and we need to spend oh, seven right, million right. pounds. <laughs> no, I, 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 John, I agree with you. I'm pointing out the madness okay. of the situation. Yes, yeah, that's exactly it. It's mad. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, to be fair, I'm only assuming that Edward is off, and then saying Furuhashi is our only viable option. If Edward stays, then that's two very, very good forwards. But yes, John, it is. We, it's mad. We, we said it in the pre-show talk off air, and I and. I wasn't joking about it. Edward, <laughs> if he sees out his contract, is a good backup. And like that is this this is an insane situation that we're in that we have so much millions of worth of asset that cannot be considered viable options. Yeah. What is going on here? What has happened? Yeah. Not just that, though, add into the mix. You've got five million for a Yeti, you've got nine million for Eddie. Then what else have you got that's not really playing? You got Julian at seven million who's injured at the moment. You've got Barkas is five million. So there you go. There's there's twenty something million of players just not getting in the squad. Unbelievable. Mm. But yeah, yeah in, in terms of um, uh, Edward's value, like you have to also something you also have to factor in is that any transfer fee we get, we're only getting sixty percent of that. So you have to also okay, what is your value for Ed? What is Edward's value as a player? So if Edward's the backup to Furuhashi, right? The way Furuhashi plays, he's playing every second game. Do you know what I mean? He, he can't play 90 minutes every game. It's not happening. Uh, he's not going to do Callum McGregor style minutes the way he plays. Um, so what is Edward's value as a second striker? Is it six, seven million? Is it the same? Is it what you would pay for Henry? In which case, if, if his value is six, seven million, that means you can't accept an offer under 11 or 12 million because that's 60%. That's what we get. So, so the value is not the absolute figure that a club would pay. The value is the figure that we would get. What is mm-hmm. our value having him leave as a free agent and play out the season? The the other problem with Edward is I I do wonder if the guy perhaps overestimates his own importance at the moment. You know, he's obviously been told that these lower lower half of the English Premier League clubs were interested in him. And he's looked at it and thought, nah, nah, I'd, I'd rather wait and go to a Liverpool or a Man United. But it's not going to happen. Right? Well, doesn't matter if he's how, coming off the bench. It uh, doesn't matter how good you are in Scotland, right? You Players, unless they are absolutely exceptional, do not go from Celtic to the top five in England. They go to a smaller English club, they prove themselves there for a year or two, and then if they're good enough, they go to Liverpool or Man United. Van Dijk being the example. Van Dijk was possibly the greatest Celtic defender I've seen in my lifetime. Well, the and best yet, rumor. Yeah. He went best... to he went to a smaller club before he went to Liverpool. That's just how it happens. Best rumor I heard about him though, Liam, was like instead if um, with Sancho moving on at Dortmund, and then what's his name because he played as a left winger as a forward. The talk was he could go to Dortmund to replace either Sancho or Haaland if he moved on. I'm like, that's the only way we'd make any money because they'd have copious amounts from that sale so they'd have something to spend. But 
why would they pay the money in 12 months' time they can get him for free or in six months' time get him to sign on the thing and then get him on a knockdown fee? So well, it's a bit of a weird one. Yeah, that, this progression track that you guys are talking about, that's the reason where this sell-on clause phenomenon. You, like, think about 20 years, had you heard of that? No, it doesn't yeah. it didn't exist. It wasn't a thing that existed. Uh, and, and you're right, this is the, the whole being that second and third tier proving ground uh, to a top tier team like Celtic, Southampton as examples uh, that is where this phenomenon arose as in yes we think your player is good enough to make this leap but we're not going to gamble on that and we want to we want you to share in that gamble with the sell on clause and knock down the transfer fee as a result uh, and in terms of Edward, so just to around the house just now, in terms of Edward, if Edward plays the way he's played since, you know, since the end of last season, so since Andrew Postacoglos came in, if An- if Edward plays that out the rest of the season, like what he's done in the last three weeks, he's a free agent. You name name for me what 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 is the best team he's going to get a contract with? Tell me, mm. look, give, give me a name. Literally, in, give me an actual name. League? In what league are we talking? Any about league, him? any league. Don't exclude anything. Maybe Marseille. That's about it. Oh, I don't even. I don't even know if he's the way that he's. I think the point Sean's making the way that he's playing right now in Ange's team. I a Newcastle. I'd say Marseille or a Benfica, something like that. He won't end up in England. I I was going to throw one out there and say maybe like a middle of the road German team, maybe like a like a Leverkusen. Uh, uh, Leverkusen or an Antri Frankfurt or something like that. No, no, a top four team, but uh, a middle of the road Bundesliga team, quite possibly. So I think that yeah. would suit his style of play as well. I actually think you guys are being overly generous. I think if he plays better than he is now, he's hitting Leverkusen or Porto. And mm. but I think the way he's playing now is is a Brighton. You yeah, know, it is a, a Sheffield United. It is a Crystal Palace. Uh, yeah, or like Anderlecht, you know, like yeah. a top Belgian team. I don't think he's hitting Leverkusen or Porto levels at the moment, even as a free agent. Aye, and it goes back to what I said a minute ago. That's where the guy himself needs a reality check. He's not as highly regarded as he seems to think he is, you know? But no. we can we we at least see that he could be. We oh, yeah. I think we, I think I think it I think all Celtic fans can see a player. Right, we we knew what Van Dyke was going to be like. We knew when Yama was a player. We knew Tierney was a player. Right, there was uh, these huge players that have come through Celtic, and Dembele is another one that go on and do really well. And we can see that Edouard has that capability, but it's his fucking attitude. It's and and you're absolutely right. It's his overinflated ego of himself. He should have. We should have let him go last season because he would have got what he's wanted, and we wouldn't have had uh, somebody who's just spat the dummy basically. It, it, I absolutely agree. The way that he's playing right now is not good enough. And I, and let's just say, argument's sake here, that he plays his contract out. How would you guys play him? Obviously, we can't let him continue to play him as an asset that he is. We can't let him continue playing. Would we play him dynamically on the left? Would we play him as a 10, maybe, just behind Kyogo? But, I mean, he's not good. He, he's just not good enough at, the, at playing the way that he's playing now. He's not good enough to be the lone striker. The Colts need a striker. God damn. Oh. <laughs> Savage. Savage. Hello, hospital. Burns unit, please. <laughs> no, I think I think the, the the way it played out on Sunday is if I can unless we until unless the squad changes, if the squad says the same as it is now, the way it played in, the way it played out on Sunday is his role for the year. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. It's a real shame. But there you we'll, go. We'll, we'll bring it back to um, Thomas Henry for a second or Henri. There's one thing I wanted to say. So have you guys seen the videos of him on YouTube kicking around everywhere? I have, oh. yes. He reminds me of a cross between. Some people are saying, oh, Jan Vinegar of Hesselink because of his, his size and the header ability. Other people I'm seeing are saying Chris Sutton. The one I'm saying, because he's French and everything, he reminds me of a young Olivier Giroud. Mm. That's the sort of player he reminds me of. But he's not young, he's 26. 
So he's ready to go straight in and hit the ground running. So if he's anything like those players, get him in. Because what, him being six four and his movement and everything, he does the same sort of running that Kyogo does, but he's nowhere near as quick, but he's still fast for a six foot four guy. Yeah, one thing that's kind of occurred to me is everyone's calling him Thomas Henry. But you, as you mentioned, Jared is French, so why is it not Thomas Henri? It, it's almost like uh, Thierry Henri has claimed the French version of the name, and everyone else gets anglicized because they're not as good as <laughs> Thierry Henri. Yeah. So yeah. Like, everyone, like, and then uh, everyone, like every every source I've ever heard is saying Henry, and I'm like, should it be? Or well, maybe maybe when he comes into Celtic, it won't be Thierry Henry anymore. It'll be Terry Henry, and then he'll yeah. be the Thomas yeah. Henri. <laughs> It'll be Tam Henry. <laughs> Tam, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tam Henry the Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just jumping on, one of the last couple of things to discuss, guys, is Gordon Strachan is coming in as a club consultant for the next three months. Now, reading through the article and what the club released, sounds like a director of football role to me. Now, is that the right move for Celtic, first of all, in your opinion? And second of all, is that the right sort of fit for what we want? Me, I don't like the idea of it. Apparently, he's going to be looking into the Colts, which is great. The youth setup, which is great, but also the women's team. Why has he got to get involved in that? Like, Fran Alonso is doing a great job there. So, I don't know. It just seems odd to me. What do you think, John? Um. I, I personally, I'm um, happy with that. I, um, I mean, there's a few criteria that I would want out of a director of football or performance director or whatever the hell we want to call it, um, sporting director. I, I, I want somebody who understands Celtic's um, way of playing. I want I want them to understand um, Celtic, Celtic's overall drive and our history and all of those things um it doesn't have to come from it but understand it um i want them to have some sort of managerial or football experience um and i want them to have that sort of um clout where they can you know attract people and i i i mean i i think strachan ticks most of those boxes to some extent um so i i would be happy if he came in permanently rather than in a temporary basis that it is um, and we can go on from there. But um, if it is a director of football, um, I think as a director of football should have, um, say, in all of aspects of um, Celtic's team. So the youth, the Colts, the women's team and the, the first team for the men's. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm OK with this personally because he ticks most of my boxes. I would view it more as the idea of like a kind of a, an external audit, if you like. He's going to come in for a couple of months and review all aspects of the football side of things. And I think that's a good thing. Having an external pair of eyes to come in and just look over everything and say, OK, maybe change this, maybe change that. This is good. Let's invest more into this. You know, companies do it all the time. You know, they bring in external auditors. And that is why... I think it's only a short-term deal with Strachan. Is he just going to come in and assess everything and then give his expert view on it? And it is an expert view because he's a former Celtic manager and he's a very well-respected international figure in football. And, yeah, I I don't see it as a director of football. Like I say, I think of it more as like an audit. And I think that's how we should view it and how we should approach it. Yeah, I, I somewhat view it the same way as Liam. And that even though they're calling it a three month consultancy, I think of it as more like a three week consultancy that's dragged out over three months because he's sharing it with his Dundee role. He, he's not left Dundee, he's still the director of football there. So I, I just think of it as like he's doing it part time, stretched over three months rather than doing it short and sharp. Um, having met Gordon Strachan a few times, um, my one concern with him is that he's very. He's got very, he's very tunnel vision. He's very myopic. He, he, he's very focused. He doesn't. He's not very good at listening and taking it. I love the guy. I really do. I think he's got great views. He's very energetic and he's very driven. And 
and he's he's focused on youth and development is all great. His tactics are great, but he can be very single minded and and myopic. And I'm ha- very happy that he's doing this role, but but I hope this is not the only source of information we're using to restructure the club. If Gordon Strachan is one of four or five consultants that consultancies that we are taking on, then that is brilliant. If he's the only one we're doing, then I think that's a very bad thing. That's okay, my you got you guys have kind of flipped my I got flip flopped a bit now because I hadn't thought of it like an audit. Okay. That actually makes sense. My concern is because his son is one of Angus coaches. That was what kind of got my back up a little bit as well when I first read it. But if he's coming in to assess things because Don Mackay's come from rugby and doesn't understand it, great. Get him some information. This is what you need to do. Your strength and conditioning is what you need to do for your scouting department. Your youth set up, your women's team, your men, fine. Get that info, pass on some of your knowledge, great. But if it's to come in permanently as a director of football, yeah, it's a no for me. I still want someone like Jackie McNamara, a bit younger, not as much of an older older figure. But we need, we, more than anything, I think we're all crying out for uh, a systemic change. You know, we, we, we need some sort of equivalent of a director of football in. So if Strachan comes in and sort of, I don't know, divvies up responsibilities and say, well, here is the hole for the director of football. Here's what they would do. Yeah, that that's absolutely ideal. We just need we just need the systems in place. We need the beginnings of that. It, it, it has to be different. We have to have a separation from the business to operations. We have to have the board having no say in player transfers. That was law at one point, and it sounds like at this point, couple of businesses have been hesitation by the board members I, that that we need better separation there we need this director football in oh uh, the the whole i think it goes beyond just saying getting a director of football and it really just it does a, whole, a rethink of what we're doing and you know like it's not just like oh yeah he's not going to come in and say yes we need a director. it really needs a rethink and, yep. and that that rethink might be complete innovation and something that no other club has. Cool, fine. If that's what comes out with the consultation. But I really I admire the willingness to do that, to bring in expertise, to get the consultation. But I really hope it doesn't stop there. I hope it becomes a broader consultation. I agree. All right, boys. So we'll change gears for the last topic here. I'll get my singing voice ready. Na 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 na. Let's all laugh at Rangers. Let's all laugh at Rangers. Fucking pricks. Are they listening in? <laughs> Last week for them. Lost to Malmo. Lost to Dundee United. The whole cinch situation that they are absolutely making a clusterfuck. Malmo's manager's John Dale Thomason's comments. Bang on. Lost to Malmo. Out of the Champions League. Ask Inco about to implode. What do you think, Johnny? Um, I, are they not? I think that's a given. I think <laughs> I think we're, we're seeing it happen in front of our eyes again. Um, I, I mean, like the the cinch stuff's completely um, it's baffling to me. I, you guys were trying to explain it to me. I'm as much as I understand the situation. I guess I'm still completely scratching my head as to why why is it ever an issue? Well, it's just it's pettiness at its highest level. So yeah, screw them. They deserve everything they get. What do you think, Sean? Yeah, BBC Sports Sound actually did a pretty good job, Tom English, uh, of talking about the cinch uh, contract situation. Uh, And just just to try and summarise it for anyone that's not been following on BBC Sports Sound, is uh, SPFL outsourced uh, sponsorship. To find a sponsorship partner, they outsourced the job. Somebody brought in cinch, who are an English car retailer they're going to pay us eight million pounds over five years 1.6 million a year uh there's a 10 percent uh, commission for that finding and sevco are saying they don't have to uh provide the inventory which is like wearing the badge on the sleeve and all that stuff uh because it conflicts with a pre-existing commercial agreement they have and there's an article which allows them to do that but 
the SPFL have said, okay, that's fine. If you show us the pre-existing contract and Sevco have said, nope, we're not going to show you that. Uh, so either they're not showing it because it doesn't exist uh, or because they're just being dicks. So one or the other, they're either uh, talking shite or they're being dicks. <laughs> so, so no matter, no matter way we cut it up they're, they're full of shit or they're being arseholes so one way or the other uh, they're in the wrong um, I, honestly my feeling and again not based on any facts but based on the way you know it's a second kind of secondary opinion is that they have because of parks is that they maybe have verbal agreements and they don't have any written contracts and that's why they can't produce it. Is it, you know, they've just got a Masonic handshake. So when the SPFL are asking them to produce a written contract to prove this, they're like, nah, because <laughs> it's not there. Simple yeah. as that. Yeah, it's, it relates to the Parks Motor Group. We looked into that a bit earlier today. So, mm -hmm. yeah, one of these other businesses. Uh, there's there's an arrogance about them that needs slapped down, though, and this could be the thing that finally crystallises it. They, for too long, they have talked down to the rest of Scottish football and acted like Billy Big Boss, and it's about time they got a slap in the face. And either way, like, like Sean said, either the contract doesn't exist or it does and they're refusing to disclose it because of something dodgy within it. Mm. In either mm. case... They are humped. They're not going to win this argument. And they're going to be forced into a very, very humiliating climb down on this. It, and that's been, going to be a joy to watch. <laughs> it, it's been exactly 10 years since the last time they were relying on Champions League money and got pumped out by Malmo. There is a be beautiful <laughs> symmetry. There is a, there is a, a poetry to this recurrence oh, uh, and, and that, that's why people have been posting these memes of Craig White saying alright two, <laughs> two, two, two pounds this time uh, instead of one like there is a real symmetry you know and, and it was just two days ago Charles Green got 6.3 million pounds paid out because of the malicious prosecution of uh, the Masons and and uh, the cops <laughs> So he got he got maliciously prosecuted, and the the Scottish government is paying out more than twenty million pounds for people who were maliciously prosecuted, as in they were prosecuted without grounds for prosecution, Jeez. on the on the back of Rangers uh, going under. Uh, was it Charles Green, uh, Paul, Paul Whitehouse, and David? I, I forget. But the, the those three they they're getting over twenty million pounds in payouts and compensation because the police and lawyers and that support rangers or supported their rangers back then couldn't accept that they it was their fault so they were reaching out for people to blame and just grabbed the the lowest hanging fruit and now it's costing us the taxpayers 20 million pounds all i have to say is fucking pay me monopoly money <laughs> <laughs> john john dal thomas and by the way what a guy Yes. Yeah, that was really. I don't know. How, I don't even know how he knew that. How did he even know that? Is he, <laughs> how does he tap into this? Like the Scottish media don't report it. So how did he know? That was vintage hun scalping, wasn't it? It really. It's absolutely mm. beautiful. To watch. Yeah, like he thought, they, 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 he had someone like Melby or someone like that get in touch with him and say, "Hey, mate, here you go. Here's some info for you." It must it. be that, yeah, or Morton Veyhorse or something. Because, like, uh, honestly, like they, they didn't even the ask him that question. He yeah. answered a question that they didn't ask. Like, <laughs> do you think Rangers are in... oh. yeah, what was it? They asked him, "Do you think Rangers are under pressure because of the home crowd or something like that?" And he went, "Or oh, are you under uh, pressure?" Yeah, probably because of the money, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Did he, Absolutely. Did he even ask him? Oh. Yeah. Uh, yep. d d didn't just bring out the elephant in the room. He brought it out and fucking shot it in front of the entire press corps. Right. He fucking shagged and it smirk, and then shot it. <laughs> the, smirk, the smirk when he said it was just the best. I was like, go you good thing. I watched the video, no joke, like six or seven times straight. And I, yeah. I was just like cackling harder and harder every time. I was just like, go you good thing. It's so unbelievable. Like, I was like, it was almost as if he was, has been tapped into Scottish football and has an agenda. It was so, like, it was so good. It was so Brilliant. good. I really enjoyed it. Um, 
<laughs> All right. So what we'll do before we wrap up the podcast, is to anyone listening in, please subscribe again. Um, our Facebook group and page, please give them a like. On Instagram and Twitter, you can follow us at Celtic Down. We've got our website, www.celticdownunder.com. And please follow our YouTube channel as well because more than likely we'll have a live show coming out at some point in the next couple of weeks. So watch your space for that. Other than that, boys, we'll uh, finish off with a final thought and, yeah, then get out of here. So over to you, John. Yes, well, my final thought is I guess PSG is going to be winning the Champions League a few times from now on. I think that's just Mm. a given now. Very strange times, but there you go. End of an era for Barcelona and maybe the beginnings of one for PSG. That's it. My final thought is that after... Sevco have lost three games in a row and looking like they might crumble. I'm going to stock up in pot noodles just in case. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> How did I follow that? Bloody hell. Um, <laughs> no, look, um, I don't want to be too morbid here, boys, but you know what? As, as I told you off air, a friend of mine passed away recently. So my final thought is going to be just to say to everybody out there, always make the most of every day you have. And take if someone says to you, let's go for a pint, go for that pint, because you never know when it might be the last time. So just be, you know, look after everybody that means something to you in this world, because you never know when they're going to leave it. Kindness costs you nothing. Exactly. And my final thought... Because it doesn't matter what I say right now because Liam I'll uh, <laughs> <your> mate. <laughs> Alright, hail hail everyone. Hail hail. <laughs>